Uh, so tonight I am talking about CSS custom properties. Uh, I'm not always a fan of hand raising for this sort of thing, but who here has heard of CSS custom properties? I mean, I've heard of it today. Then you don't count. Uh, cool. Uh, has anyone who didn't hear of CSS custom properties, have, have you heard of CSS variables? Okay, one and the same. They're the same thing. Uh, they're technically called CSS custom properties in the specification for CSS, but colloquially we call them CSS variables because it's much easier to say. Uh, so what this gives us is the ability to create variables that you'd have in another programming language inside of CSS. So a quick show of hands, since I have so many new faces I don't actually know, uh, who here writes CSS somewhat regularly? Even if it's in JavaScript. Uh, okay, cool. And who here does not write CSS? Who here avoids CSS like the plague? Fair enough. All right, CSS is a brand new world from where it was five or six years ago, and it has a whole bunch of new and amazing things. Uh, I talked quite a bit about stuff like CSS Grid and new properties that actually affect visual display, uh, but tonight I'm gonna take a stab at something that is a little bit outside my wheelhouse, and that is the more programmatic side to CSS. I'm hoping that some of you that write your CSS and JavaScript are gonna find some things that you're gonna wanna incorporate into that. Uh, but before I actually dive into that, a question that almost everyone's going to ask is can I use what we're gonna talk about tonight, right? Is it in enough browsers to use? So I actually haven't looked at this yet. Uh, so let's take a look at CSS custom properties. As you can see, the actual name on CanIUse.com <laughs> is CSS variables, even though that's not correct. And as you can also see, Internet Explorer is not supported for custom properties. Oh, wait, I have used this. Custom properties or can I use? I've, I've, made, I've made CSS variables. Okay. Did you make it in CSS or did you make it in SAS? In CSS. Then huge kudos, because not very many people have. I, I set up a base 16 color scheme. And that would be way, I, yeah. one of the one of the things I'm going to show later on that I didn't make is a is a cool thing using HSL uh, colors that you can use in CSS variables, which is super cool. Uh, but you can see across the board, other than Internet Explorer, we have pretty good usage statistics, right? Uh, the percentage uh, in the U.S. is about 94 percent almost. So 94 percent of users have browsers that are using browsers that support custom properties. If you're supporting Internet Explorer. There's not a whole lot I've got for you. You can use a preprocessor to use them both at the same time, uh, but they are not ready for production for you yet. Uh, but they will be amazing in the future. So I'm gonna dive in, uh, and we're gonna talk about first how we actually set up our first custom property. And we're gonna take a very, very simple example. We have a standard button, right? This is technically an anchor. I'm sorry, this is on the projector. That's, that's It was like that two months ago too, and I don't understand what happened with it. Uh, but as you can see, we have this button here. It has a background color of tomato, my personal favorite CSS keyword color. Uh, it has a color, which is this font color of white. I'm changing its display value from inline to inline block. This is gonna allow padding to affect it. I'm setting a little bit of padding top and bottom and left and right. I'm gonna round the corners of it a little bit with border radius. And then the standard link is gonna have an underline. I don't want that, so I say text decoration none. Actually, let me pull this up in oops, showing off later stuff, uh, and full page, since we don't need the code quite yet. There we go, it's a little bit better. Uh, so the first thing I want us to do is we're gonna refactor this button to instead of using all these keywords in the CSS, we're going to change them all to be CSS variables, to be CSS custom properties. So the first thing we have to talk about is exactly what that looks like, right? And so, oh, it's right there, it's oh. right on the things I wanted to show, uh, and not, sh not give away the actual code. but. Uh, if you were here three years ago when Josh presented about beam syntax, there was a hot drama around it about how beam syntax looked. There were double dashes everywhere, double underscores everywhere, and there was a lot of memtech drama about it. It was ridiculous because it's not that big a deal. Um, <laughs> but if you don't like beam syntax, BEM syntax for your CSS, you're not going to like the way that CSS custom properties look because every single one of them is always going to start with a double dash. That is the syntax for them. So as you can see up here, I've got, uh, when you actually are defining the variable, you're gonna define it double dash whatever variable name. And uh, I don't know if it takes underscores inside of it, but it definitely can take dashes. It definitely takes snake case. Ryan's saying, yes, it does take underscores. 
So really anything but spaces you can kind of concatenate together. Uh, and then when you call it, you're going to call it with this var method, the var parentheses, that same variable name. So down here, we're going to set all of our custom properties that are going to handle all of the styling for our buttons, right? So the first thing we have is a new CSS pseudo selector. If you're not familiar with pseudo selectors, anytime you see colon something in a CSS selector, so colon hover, colon visited, colon, all these things that like links deal with a lot, uh, that's a pseudo selector. Uh, and root is a new one, which literally is just the root object. This is our global scope in CSS variables. So if you don't like CSS because it's globally scoped, I'm glancing back at Nathaniel, uh, this is actually, there's some cool scoping stuff that happens with CSS variables that we'll get into a little bit. But overall, just know that when you're defining a global variable in CSS, you're defining it on your root element, on that root pseudo class. And then I just define out, again, the hardest thing in programming is naming. So whatever names you want, dash, dash, name. So I'm defining our background color, tomato. Our foreground color, I want to be white. Uh, button display is changing between inline to inline block. Uh, button padding, button corners, button decoration, button text align, all these things that I need to declare out, but was declaring as a value in my CSS before, I'm going to declare as a variable now. Sorry, can I interrupt? Yeah. So back to the root. Yes. Can I use any other? We're, we're getting there. We're going to get there. I got a whole example about it. All right. It's, it, that is an, an excellent question, though. Uh, <laughs> but for our basic example, we're going to start with everything globally scoped. Uh, and so let me scroll down further, because that's in the way. Yeah, this is about as far as I got with my experimentation. And this, if, if you did nothing but this, and didn't have something like a preprocessor like SAS or less, this would be a great advantage anyway. So that's the, like, the number one powerful thing in SAS and less is the fact that you can set variables. You can do it in vanilla CSS now. So that's cool. Uh, but yeah, so you can see here, we're declaring all those properties again. And this time, background color is now being set to variable, parentheses, dash, dash, button, background, right? All the way down the line, I'm redeclaring everything as these new variables. And the output is identical, right? We have a button, has a little bit of padding around it, white color, tomato background, and we're declaring it in variables instead. And to prove that we're declaring it in variables, let's go back into editor view. Let me come down here so I don't have to back up. And I'm going to show you in here that we have, uh, in the HTML, the first container has a uh, what is it? A button that has a class of button, right? You can see on the right hand side maybe uh, button uh, anchor href equals pound class equals button. That's where I'm declaring those button styles. In the next container down, I have more text obviously because I was doing all that stuff in the code up there. But we have a button down here, and let me know if you can't see anything or things are a little weird or wonky. Uh, here we go with an anchor that is a class of button dash with bears, right? So we're using variables on this class, and down here we had all the CSS that I just declared on that uh, HTML page right here as well. If I come up and I change our background color uh, to blue, and I scroll to where that is here. So here is the one that's not declared with variables, and here is the one that is. So I change that variable value and I get a new output, which is not something that we could just, we could do this in standard CSS. It wouldn't be that big a deal to overwrite a color. Uh, but we're gonna get into more and more powerful things as we go along. So any questions on, this is the basics of custom properties, right? Any questions on that? You declare a custom property, you can use it with the var method in CSS on any property that would take a value of any sort. Really handy. It is incredibly handy for theming, and there's a whole example on that as well. Um, I have so, a question. Yeah. So can you use shorthand in there? What do you mean by shorthand? So like if you want to do a background image, can you center it, and you can put any string you want in there? It's right? a value. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a string, it's a, it's a unit, it's a whatever, as long as it is what you would then use for one property. Good question. And if you didn't hear the question was, can I use a shorthand, like the background shorthand, or like padding one rem instead of padding and four four numbers there. Yes, you very much can. You can also break that up. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to cover that here, but you could say, uh, I'm going to use padding since it's the easier, uh, easier shorthand. The padding CSS property takes four values, three values, two values, or one value. Uh, and so you could use any number of those, but you could also break it up 
and set a variable for top padding, right padding, bottom padding, left padding, and adjust those in different ways depending on the scenario. So you can use shorthand, you can break up longhand into a new form of shorthand that is then editable in various ways. Yeah, so that was a trick question to get to the actual question. Can you, since it's just a string, can you shove two values in one variable? What do you mean by that? No. So like background color and color, like a mix in, like a mix in, yeah. You, could, you cannot break them apart, uh, but you could have one variable that's used in multiple ways. Background color. set a bar equal to like. You can set it to, to multiple things in one, but you can't take yeah. it as like a map. You couldn't like have a map like you would in, in SAS and break that map in various ways. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a one to one kind of relationship. Okay. So can I ask the back over on this example with the padding colon and you mentioned how you can have padding that's yeah. one, two, three, four. So can that be padding colon bar dash dash but dash padding dash top? It would, it would end up space. Yes. Yeah, you'd put a space in between each one. You'd have <coughs> a new bar decoration for each one. Okay. Uh, and in fact, I was going to do that. I ran out of time. I've got a whole theming section later where all these variables you can put like form inputs for. Uh, and I did not get to that part of it. I just took up your time with the question. <laughs> Perfect. It worked out great. Um, but yeah, so you can't break it apart. It's time out. Yeah. Sure. It is. It is any CSS unit, right? So a uh, text value, an HSL, uh, an RGB, a keyword, anything you want there. I'm doing something later on with it uh, that requires it to be in the text value just for, uh, so I'm using a color chooser in the theming example. So the text is actually what you need for that because that's what it accepts. But you can use any keyword you want if you're not using that for a use case. Okay. Yeah. This can be any string you can imagine. Anything with valid CSS can fit in there, no problem. Any, any a CSS value can fit in there, no problem. All good questions. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Tilly. Um, so let's talk a little bit about scoping of these variables. Because actually, the cool thing about this is the cascade affects it. And the people hate the cascade, and I'm not one of them, but I'm sure there's some of them in, the, in this room. But the cascade is super powerful, and we can utilize it with CSS proper, uh, custom properties just as we can use it with classes and anything else. So if I were to have a different stripe, which in fact, or a different container, which in fact, this container here is a different container, that instead of having just the class of container on it, had special, and inside that just had the exact same anchor, right, of class button with bars. I'd have to call button with bars again inside of our container special to change that in vanilla CSS. But with CSS custom properties, what I can do is I can say that inside of my class special, inside the scope of class special, change these custom properties to be a different value. So in this case, I'm overwriting the values of the background color changing it to light blue. The light blue doesn't play well with the white text, so I change the text foreground color to a dark gray, and then instead of having it be an inline block, I want it to be a full width button. And so I change the inline block button display to block instead, and it changes it just inside this scope, just inside the scope of the special container. Does that make sense? Yeah, so you have to do special space A. The, the way we would have done before would have been dot special space A dot, you know, button, basically. And in this case, yeah. So uh, specificity rule. Specificity, yes. The same. Cascade, specificity, all that does take, in, take into account, 100%. It follows all the same rules as CSS. It just allows you to scope things a little differently. So in the past, I would have had to have multiple selectors chained together to beat the specificity and to deal with that or deal with the cascade. Here, I can give it to a parent or a parent or a grandparent or a grandparent and have it filtered down below. And then the more specific I get, the more I can overwrite it if I need to. So, bread and butter of what this gives us beyond what, say, a SAS variable gives us is the fact that it's in the browser and can be modified by JavaScript. So on the fly, instead of having to go and change CSS properties, I can change the CSS variable in JavaScript and have the same effect. And that's going to be very, very easy to do some theming later on. But let's talk about actually how we do that. 
I'm going to go ahead and go back into our editor view. I think it's going to be a little bit better. And we're going to do a quick dark mode toggle. Right? So I click this one button and it changes my entire page to a dark mode. It's a more and more common design pattern on the web. I personally don't like reading stuff in dark mode, but that's my personal preference and not a lot of other people. Uh, so this allows us to do one of a few things, and there are multiple ways of handling it in JavaScript and CSS combined. Uh, so first, actually, I can't go over to the uh, code pen because I actually didn't do it this way in code pen. We can very easily set up a dark mode toggle. So that's what I'm doing here in the JavaScript. Let dark mode toggle equal, and I'm finding on this page something that has a class of dark uh, that actually gets changed to dark mode toggle, but dark mode toggle, and that is the class that's attached to this button down here, which we'll inspect and take a look at. And you can see here we have anchor that has a class of button with bars and dark mode toggle. And so that's how I'm hooking into that with JavaScript. And then inside of the rest of the JavaScript, what I can do is I can uh, have an event listener listening for that click, and on the click of that button, I can go and find the CSS variables that I want to change and change them in JavaScript. Now, my personal preference on a design pattern like this is still going to be to use a toggle in CSS, and that's going to be to change a class on our body. Obviously, there are React and Vue and all sorts of better ways to do this in JavaScript overall, but very easily we can say, fit my body, and then when it's clicked, Chain, uh, toggle on the class list, list a dark mode class on the body. And the CSS in that dark mode class, I can overwrite multiple CSS variables. So I need to change the uh, background color of my body, which I cheated and set that up on the body in the code pen. Change my color to white instead of the black text that was already on it. And then change my button colors too to be not as harshly red. And what that's doing here is it's just toggling that class, but allows me to contain all that and just the variables I need and not have to go change it in multiple places in my CSS. So changing the individual custom properties doesn't make a whole lot of sense in this case, but as we're gonna see in a second, we can loop through a whole bunch of stuff in JavaScript and change a whole bunch of things at a time. So all we're doing here is we're on the document, grabbing the style and we're setting the property. And you can do that in JavaScript with just this one little line, set property, it takes a CSS property of some sort, in this case we're using the custom properties that we've got, and a value for a second argument there. Does so that set it on the suit? This is the root, root yeah. Okay. Uh, in this uh, document dot document element, I believe, and I meant to look this up, document element's a keyword on document, so it's going to get that root. You could actually have query selector and find the selector you want in there instead. I, I have to look that up. Did still. you try it on document dot style? I did not. Um, in fairness, I, this is, I was taking some examples and piecing together my advanced knowledge. I've been doing the variables for a little bit, some of these more advanced JavaScript things I haven't yet. Uh, yeah, it's entirely possible uh, that this could have been just document.style, but I'm not entirely sure. The, the uh, getting method that we're gonna look at in a minute is kind of crazy looking, so I'm wondering if it is there, uh, but I'm not sure. Again, not a custom variable expert yet. Uh, definitely not a JavaScript expert on that. Which is why I actually still prefer setting a class that has all my dark mode variables and having that toggle the class list back and forth. And um, just curious yeah. why you prefer to have light mode. Well, why I prefer light mode over dark mode? Or? No, uh, to have it. <laughs> I can talk about that too. Okay. Uh, Instead of doing these, you know, the other option? So the other option, I set all these variables, right? And I reset them in JavaScript. And then if I wanted it to be a toggle, I'd have to set it back or create oh, an object okay. and switch between those two objects. Okay. This gives me the, the super easy class, which is body.classlist.toggle. It's just easier JavaScript, and also it gives me control in CSS. And I like my control for styles in CSS, because okay. that's what I write. Okay. So yeah, you can very easily do it this way. I think doing those sets is gonna make more sense when you're theming something bigger and not doing a quick toggle. Okay. Any other questions about that? So now we're gonna talk a little bit more about how we can do theming on any site and give the user the control to theme. So here we have a section and we have some simple form controls. It's one, one form has all these things inside of it. I've got four color pickers, <coughs> a select drop down, and a border radius. I should have removed that because it only kind of works, but it does work a little bit. 
um, range selector for the border radius. And it goes between zero and 50, I think. So I can very easily change my page options around. I can change my background color to this lovely horrific red. <laughs> I can come in here, I can change my foreground color to be white on that red. And you'll notice actually, well you might not notice because you're like, okay. I have that same variable as uh, the border color as well. It's actually a drop shadow on those elements so that when I change that one variable in, um, in CSS, it changes both the borders and the text color at the same time. And then this, this is an awful tomato button on that, so we can go ahead and change some options on that with the color picker. We can say this should be neon green, so that's great. And we can have the color be, what's the most horrific thing we can find? Uh, this light blue. Purple would be, actually purple would, would be better, right? It would be ugly, but you could read it. Uh, <laughs> and then if I wanted to, instead of being uh, full width, uh, not full width, I could change it to be full width, Right. <laughs> exactly. So I can I can really <coughs> really burn out some retinas in the room, uh, and then I can very easily come in here and adjust that border radius with a toggle there as well. So all these things are things that you could give to your user. And, and my thought on this, uh, I don't know if it, I don't know how nerdy the room is, but there's Penny Arcade, which is a super old web comic now, right? Standard video game web comic, and in its entire run. It has always looked like this, with this blue background and white text on top of it. And the author of it, the guy who actually writes the comics and then writes posts along with it, used to be like super verbose in his posts. He'd write paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs, and I'd read it to the really great writer, but my eyes would get tired, and I'd go into Firebug back in the day, and I would change the styles myself to be white background, black text on top of it, so it was just burning my eyes. So like if they had like a little widget, I could click a button, select my own styles, I could build that into a, into a plugin if I wanted to, but it'd be cool like, to have that, and actually when I rebuild my personal site, I'm probably gonna do it, so that if you want whatever I use for my banner color to be a different color, you can feel free to choose that and go to town with it. Uh, so the actual code behind this is not super complex. Uh, it's not the quickest thing in the world, and we'll hopefully be able to talk about it, and I'll be able to talk about it in a, an intelligent manner. Uh, but most of it's not happening in CSS. The main CSS is still going to be this idea that we set our variables, we call our variables on the button, and then we're gonna let JavaScript take over from there. So I'm gonna pull up our JavaScript. And we're gonna take a look at this real fast. So the basics that are happening is we have, technically in the HTML here, we have a form. In that form, there's a number of inputs. Technically, the select is not an input, and that cost me 15 minutes today. Um, why isn't this working? Oops, I was calling for inputs. Um, and so what I've got here is I've got this thing that's, that's finding all the inputs inside of that. Technically, when you, when you use query selector all, it's not giving you an array back, and I want to be able to loop through it in an array. So that's just some syntactic trigger to turn an array-like object into an array so the JavaScript can loop through it properly. Uh, which is super weird to look at, but basically it's just some array functionality there. Um, and then on top of that, we then loop through, uh, oh, I also here, this is, this is the quick hack that I did to get the select in there. I say, go ahead and take that array and push the select into that array, just because I needed to get working and didn't have much time left. Uh, and then loop through that array, and we're gonna do two different things. The first thing we're gonna do is I wanna set my initial values, because I want my uh, page to actually show the current value of background color, the current value of font color, and all these current values, which this is what's broken about that. That doesn't work right now for the border radius selector. So I've got a function down here that the main thing that it's doing is it's taking that CSS property, and we're going to use get, this is the weird thing I was talking about a second ago, right? You say get computer style, you call the element, which in this case is the document element, that root element, and then you say get property value of something. So we don't want to write over and over again, I want this value for this one, this value for this one, this value for this one, this value for this one. So we can loop through it and in our HTML, which let's find that, the forms all have an ID. Uh, you can have this be a name, you can have it be a class, you can have it be whatever you need it to be, that matches up with the variable name in CSS so that I can call it in that loop and pull that value in. And so that's what this set value is doing here. 
is it's saying, all right, I'm going to run back and forth with this change where this is set up. Uh, so yeah, so document uh, style set property. Uh, this is a dash dash you can't quite see. So it's uh, string contamination is the uh, template literal notation, which is a back pick, and then it allows me to put a string in here uh, and then evaluate this value, in this case, this dot ID, which is the ID of the input that I have. And then the second argument for set property is a value of some sort. I'm setting that new value up here. This is what I had to do for the fact that I have to handle something that has a pixel or something that doesn't have a pixel, right? So technically all my CSS custom properties, the ones that have units have a pixel value. Three pixel border radius, my padding, which I'm going to get to has pixels. So I had to have something in there to, uh, to change that. So the main thing that's happening there is I'm looking at it, looking at the data. If it has a data attribute of suffix, uh, remove the suffix basically. If not, have the entire value in there. And then from there, uh, that was the that was the handle update. I was reading the wrong one. I apologize. Let me actually highlight so I know I'm looking at it over there. Uh, so yeah, set initial value grabs that computer property. I logged it because I'm really late in JavaScript. And then uh, the updated value is if it's a suffix, replace the pixel with a blank string that removes the pixel value, and then change the input value to that updated value. So that's taking all my CSS properties that match something in my form grabbing the value, doing what it needs to do to set these things, right? And this is what I had to do with the, uh, I, I actually started with tomato and white as keywords in my CSS custom properties. But when you pull it, these uh, color selectors, the default HTML5 color selectors, require a hex value. They require it to be a six, uh, a six number hex value, right? It has to be pound sign, six digits of some sort which three-digit short code didn't work in that, as I discovered today, I didn't know that. Uh, so yeah, so these required that, so I had to go back and change all my custom properties to be the hex value instead of the keywords. Uh, and so yeah, so that basically loops through, sets those initial values, and then after that, I attach an event listener to the change that's happening in each of these. Again, if you're using an actual good two-way binding JavaScript framework, it'd be a lot smoother than this. But I'm adding an event listener on change, handle our update, and all that's doing is it's grabbing the, uh, the current value, uh, and then if it has a suffix, changing that value to actually add the TX back on. Again, better ways of doing this if you have more than about a day and a half that I had to put this together. And then uh, writing to the document style, set property, this ID, this, prop or this property value. So this creates a way of almost unlimited kind of theming on these properties. What questions about that? That's a lot, and it's pretty dim up there, and I'm pretty dim, so I would completely understand it if that didn't hit the mark. Could, uh, um, I'm sorry, could yeah. you explain uh, the computer property thing? So what's happening there, and I'm, I'm okay. not an expert on this, is the Joshua property, but CSS has this idea of the value you set and then the computed thing that actually gets shown up. Right. Okay. So if you were to do like a count value, the computed property is di is different than the count. Okay. So if I had in there count one round plus two pixels, right, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, and one round equals sixteen pixels, and two pixels equals two pixels, the computed property would be eighteen pixels. <coughs> okay. So it would, it would return that out of there. Oh. I assume. Okay. I haven't actually dug deep into the JavaScript for that, but in terms of CSS, if you open up your inspector. Uh, oh, that, that's, let's refresh that page. Uh, also, you could obviously like log this to like local storage or to a database or whatever you have for a user. Uh, but if you go into your elements panel in Chrome, uh, you have this idea of there's the styles, right? And these are the ones that you set. And then you have this idea of the computed panel. And that is everything else that the browser is doing with that. Okay. So the background color, I set as a hex value on this, but it's actually computing it to an RGB value. Uh, and then so on and so forth. There's uh, background positions that automatically getting added in there, and a whole bunch of stuff that's in there. It's, it's anything that the browser has to figure out, yep. okay. given the information that you are already giving. It is literally the computed value from the user input value. Okay. It is the computed. Uh, and there might be a better way of pulling that, I'm not entirely yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so I want to show off a couple other things. Oh, yeah, yeah, shoot. So what's <laughs> document, document, document? Uh, where was that again? That was right up there. Uh, this? Yeah. 
So documents the win uh, not the windows, the, the, the document, right? And then there's a property on that, which again, this is what I was going to look up. I'll look it up right now. Uh, document. Schools, schools. No, 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 no. Um, you doing it wrong? Uh, okay, so so literally the notes here, right? For any non-empty HTML document, document that document element will always be an HTML element. So it is it is the root. In this case, the the colon root is the CSS version of that. Okay. Which I this, this that was a a property on the document that I discovered today. So. I believe if you've never seen it because I haven't either. Um, but yeah, uh, other things you can kind of do. Uh, this is actually where I got my form controls uh, earlier today. Uh, this is Wes Boss. He did a, a quick uh, CSS custom property blur effect here. And so you can very easily change the spacing on it. That's adding padding all around. Uh, and then you can change your blur value. So it can be zero and that would get to hard edges or like super blur. And you can change that same color variable. And he's changing his JS and his Twitter handle down there with that same custom property. Uh, so again, like very, you can do very, very complex things much, much more easily than we could in the past with just updating these, these values. But this, this is one of my favorite developers in the world. Her name's Nina Kravitz. Uh, and this is actually a pretty complex thing happening in CSS. It is a pure CSS color mixer. Right? You can mix two colors together and get that middle output. And so what's happening in this, I'm gonna give my best explanation, keeping in mind that I did not write this code whatsoever and I'm not smart enough to over it, uh, is that we have two sets of base values. We have color one and color two, and they are HSL values. Hue, saturation, and not lightness, but is it lightness? Luminosity. Luminosity. Yeah. Lightness, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so. So the hue is the color, the, the saturation is how saturated that color is, and the luminosity is how bright it is from white to black. So you've got those three values, and they can make any color that you need them to, give or take various scientific things that I can't even talk about. Uh, and so she has two sets of colors, color 1H, color 1S, color 1L, color 2H, S, L, right? And then she has a calc on that, because you can calc more than length, right? So I mentioned as a, as a calc example, one RAM plus two pixels, right? You can calc any value to get added together. Oh. So in this case, she's also creating CSS variables doing math. So she's saying my average H, my average S, and my average L. So all that that's doing, it declares variable color one, variable color two, divided by two. An average, right? Two things add together divided by the number of things that there are. The average of it. So the average of the H, S, and L and then all she has to do is on this color mixed class, she has a background of that mixed color, which she is setting out. Uh, she's setting up the yeah. Right here. Yeah. So then she takes, she takes those, those three average values, right? And she says, all right, my HSL, which is a way of doing color in CSS, is these three values. My new hue, my average hue, my average saturation, and my average luminosity. So that means that anytime I change these values, so this will change the purple on the left, and I don't know these values very well, so we'll change it to 100, right? So now we have this puke green, not quite puke green, and not puke green at all, because it's taking the average of those colors. And I can also come in, I can change my saturation down to, let's say, 50%. Is this how those color generators are made? Uh, it, that's what this looks like. It highly depends. Uh, most of that's probably still written in, in JavaScript. <laughs> Because um, most of them weren't written in the past six months. They should be done this way. They're maybe, not like maybe they will be. Maybe uh, just because it's green. But I'll really <laughs> like well, let's change that. Let's uh, see if we still <laughs> like it. Uh, <laughs> uh, if nope. it's okay, fair enough. Uh, so yeah, we can we can change these to really whatever values that fit within that, and it's going to mix those two sets of values. All in CSS, no JavaScript required, because CSS can do some minor math. It can do some variable setting and it can reset variables to other things. Yeah. But you could use JavaScript to like turn a hex value into HSL. Yes. Right. Like that would be cool. Yeah. Yeah. That wasn't a question. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. That was also not a question. Good. Uh, I'm glad we cleared that up. Uh, but yeah, you very much. Sure. All right. Uh, 
Oh, no, he's if you mix the hue, saturation, and lightness of those two colors together, you get green. When you're dealing with light, yeah. not when you're in a sunburst. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, and again, I'm not a huge color expert on that, but it's, it's taking the average, right? And you can do a whole bunch of different operations using the same methodology. And that's, uh, Tony, that's what you were kind of saying before. Like all these color like creators, like these palette creators, they're really just doing math on the color values. And so you can do any number of math operations to make, you know, complementary colors, uh, adjacent colors, all those things. If you do the math behind how the color spectrum works, I'm sure that's Googleable. Oh, I'm sure it is too. I'm sure it's honestly already been done in CSS Very Cool as well. Uh, but most of them, I bet, are still written in JavaScript because that's where you would have done math. Not well because JavaScript doesn't do math well. But. That's why I keep telling everyone I was doing. So that, that's all I got kind of prepared. But I'm happy to talk about anything else. Uh,